Welcome to this vodcast and podcast brought to you from the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific in Canberra. My name is Nicholas Farrelly and I'm a researcher here in our college where I study politics in Southeast Asia. It's for that reason that it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Nurul Iza Anwar, a rising star of the Malaysian political scene here to Canberra. Nurul Iza, it's really wonderful that you could take the time to join us today. So, first of all, welcome to Canberra. It's really wonderful to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Cheers, our pleasure. So, I know that there are millions of people out there who know a great deal about your story already. Uh, but for those who don't know the details, can you perhaps just give us a quick rundown of how you first became interested in Malaysian politics? Um, where did it all begin for you? It all began in 1998 uh, during the sacking and eventual um, arrest of Anwar Ibrahim, who's the, at the time, former Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Malaysia after the 1997 uh, economic crisis that engulfed the, the region. And of course, um, I was a young student then, and uh, Anwar Ibrahim is my father, and it was a real political awakening, not just for myself, but for hundreds of thousands of uh, Malaysians, especially young people, as we term the Reformasi generation, because 98 was really the start, the spark of a reform movement in, in Malaysia. And, um, you know, it, it began from there. Um, he was incarcerated in politically trumped-up charges in, in the year 1999, which has been alluded to by the International Commission of Jurists in their report. And uh, I personally got involved to fight for his uh, rights as a political prisoner, as well as uh, others who were victimised in Malaysia, especially with regards to their civil and political liberties. And I worked alongside with the opposition movement, and eventually I, I was a natural progression to contest in the last general elections, and now I have succeeded in being elected as a member of parliament in the from the People's Justice Party, which is my party, which came to be in 1999. In Malaysia's 2008 general election, you were elected to parliament. In doing so, you actually defeated a sitting government minister. I'd really like to know, how did that feel? It's a culmination of many, many feelings, actually. You know, we, a lot of us, um, myself, a lot of the younger candidates, uh, from the People's Justice Party. We joined the elections uh, because we wanted to um, continue the legacy of multiracialism in Kaadilan, my party. And we wanted to really encourage young people, uh, especially voters, to at least, you know, cast uh, their vote in the elections and just give a sort of a, a message that we're, we're, we'll, we'll do this, we're courageous enough to try to, to do our best to, to fight for change. So when, during the last uh, three days of the campaign period, it began to dawn upon me that uh, there was a real momentum against the ruling uh, government. And uh, I, you know, it hit me then, I, perhaps I might really get through this. Um, so when, when it actually happened, of course, you know, it was a huge uh, shock and um, pleasant surprise. And I think uh, what was important is what then how can you do to ensure that this becomes a lasting change um, towards the creation of a possible two-party system in Malaysia. Many people watching this interview will immediately appreciate that you are still really very young. What, in your view, is the role of youth in a political system like Malaysia's? I think, you know, right now we have about 4.1 million uh, as yet unregistered but eligible voters majority of which are, are young people. And you can see post-2008, uh, post the last general elections, all political parties actually trying to compete with one another to get them registered, to win over the young people. Um, and for us, uh, for the People's Justice Party, we have actually moved to elevate a lot of younger personalities at the forefront and key positions. Um, I also ran for the vice presidency of the party in our last direct elections and I won. And I think it's important to, to say that youth-related issues are ma mainstream issues because we are a young nation, Malaysia, and we must uh, 
continue to be relevant with the aspirations and needs of the young people, to continue to be supported by them. And I feel that for me, for my political party, um, we are a new political party. Uh, we were created in 1999, the youngest in, well, among the youngest, there's so many political parties since then. But uh, we have the opportunity to shape um, the direction, the agenda in the party. And I think that should be uh, something we should work on consistently, especially in trying to project a new Malaysia devoid of racialist or rac racist rhetoric. Are there any particular challenges for a young woman starting out in politics in Southeast Asia? What advice would you give for those out there who are perhaps hoping to follow in your footsteps? Oh, advice? Uh, it sounds so condescending. I mean, I'm still learning every day. I think, um, you know, of course, the, the whole uh, landscape is very much f um, made to fit a man's role. I mean, I must say that. But having said that, you know, you, you've seen so many developments and, and, and success um, by many, many other women leaders. Aung San Suu Kyi, of course, she remains an inspiration to so many in Southeast Asia. And um, the fact that for our party, uh, Wan Aziza is a woman, my mother, she's the president of the party, that helped create a new sense of awareness where you see in public rallies, very rarely people, hundreds of thousands, actually pay attention to a woman speaker, but right now it's the norm. We've even influenced the Islamic party to field a, can a female candidate in the last by-election in the state of Johor. So for me, it's really important to understand women, um, including Muslim women, we have so much to give. And our role as homemakers only adds on um, such an important dimension on the understanding and the, uh, the agenda on how to elevate a particular society. So I, I take it um, like uh, you know, if, if, if my involvement can inspire others to join in, I would say please, please do, because uh, women also um, are very, very successful in the professional field in Malaysia. We have a female central bank governor, uh, we have a female head of the Securities Commission. So we've made all these inroads, and why not politics? And uh, I feel that at the end of the day, um, we uh, are the best representatives to bring up the issues affecting women, which we should not relate. You know, it's not relegated to women alone. You know, women related issues are mainstream issues. Your father, Anwar Ibrahim, is still a major player in Malaysia's political life. And of course, as many of our viewers and listeners will remember, he was here himself at the ANU not that long ago. Your mother is, we shouldn't forget, a renowned political figure in her own right as well. Do you consider them to be your mentors? Um, well, certainly they, they have left such a lasting impact on, on, on me. I grew up with this um, larger-than-life vision of my father, um, who was the Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister. But I, I feel that um, when I got involved in politics, it is a vocation that you would have to own uh, yourself. I mean, I, I think it was a decision I made because I believed in the struggles that we were fighting for, and it's not because of any particular individual. So that um, journey, you know, trying to f from being Anwar's daughter, Aziza's daughter, to really um, just being a politician in your own right, making your own mistakes, um, you know, based on your own judgments, and learning from them um, is, is also equally important, if not more so. So for me right now, uh, the challenge is um, how do we survive and how do we make sure that the ideals brought about or brought by my parents will live on, not just in me, but a whole generation of leaders. You see, um, because we want to further democratize the country. So it is um, important to cultivate a whole set of generation of leaders with progressive ideas, with ideas to uh, continue this democratic path. I appreciate that this is a, a slightly personal question, but I'd really like to know what's it like in your family, say when you're all sitting around the dinner table, do you discuss anything except for politics? Well, I think um, we've gotten to a stage where we try to be as professional as possible. I think at the dinner table to keep our sanity. We must talk about personal 
uh, things about the family, about... I have two children, so uh, my, my, grandpa, my, my father dotes on them. And uh, we try to really reduce um, in talking about either his court case, the second uh, political persecution he's facing, or even party politics. Because again, we, we are, we're very busy individuals and we meet each other during the political bureau meetings. Uh, of the party as well as the um, opposition coalition meetings. So <laughs> I think it's always important to, to have a balance, um, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, I think he would enjoy me as his daughter at home on the dinner table rather than, and of course, you know, having to put up with certain arguments with me <laughs> in, the, in the political scene. So, yeah. Now changing the tone somewhat, what are your greatest fears for the future of Malaysia? I think uh, right now we're really facing a challenging uh, terrain ahead of us, the opposition I mean. Of course one is presented through the case uh, that they have fielded against my father, which you know smacks of um, political conspiracy similar to the first sodomy case in 1998. And uh, related to that is, of course, the continuing efforts to circumvent uh, the opposition's F, um, work in communicating with the public. You know, we, we do have various legislation, the Sedition Act, the Internal Security Act, that's continuously used to curb the space, um, the freedom of speech by many opposition leaders as well as other non-governmental leaders. So I view the current administration of Najib Tun Raza as, uh, you know, going back somewhat to the Mahathirist years, um, a little bit more hardliner, but very well masked in a very effective and um, co sophisticated communication um, uh, messaging. So certainly uh, it's not going to be easy for us. We have lost somewhat some momentum, the opposition, post-2008 and we have to regain the momentum and remind the Malaysian people that the opposition is the only coalition that is committed to implementing political reform and we have prepared a series of legislation to this effect including our promises in an orange book themed um, manifesto so for me it's a question of time if we manage to meet and communicate this uh, ideals and our promises and our credibility is, is sort of extended to the electorate, then we have a better chance at winning. But um, at the end of the day, we must make sure we have sufficient observers in the next general elections because I fear it will be riddled with a lot of fraud and fraudulent practices. Um, so that of course, you know, uh, it's important how the elections conducted. One is campaigning, but one is also making sure that there's no fraud taking place. Recently, when Malaysian political activist Raja Petra Kamarudin was here at the ANU, I, I had the opportunity to ask him about how he'd like to be remembered. I think his answer was somewhat eye-opening. So to finish, I should really ask you the same question. Nurul Iza, when, when all is said and done, how would you like to be best remembered? I think I'm lucky if people remember me at all. I mean, I, you know, you have to put things in perspective. Um, you know, what you do is not for to. You shouldn't personalize the struggle. You are you're only a player in the bigger picture and bigger scheme of things. That's one. But I, I'm actually right now with my colleagues in Pakatan Rakyat, the opposition coalition. We've submitted um, a bill to be discussed in Parliament, which is entitled the Emergency Revocation Bill. Now, Egypt has had its 30-year emergency declaration revoked after Mubarak's fall. Malaysia still has an emergency declaration after 47 years. So I feel this is the best time that we could very well offer this alternative, a bipartisan possible cooperation with the government to revoke our emergency declaration and return and ensure the laws that are implemented in the country are in line with the spirit of the constitution. So if I can do that and perhaps my name can be attached to the effort, then uh, it's something that I, I look forward to. Um, but again, you know, like I said, it's not a, a, a person, it's not about the individual, it's about the collective effort. 
Well, thank you once again for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you.